This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Good. How are you? Oh, you know. Oh, here we go. Nah, I'm not going to talk about it this week. All right. We're going to skip over the We're going to skip over the weekly, the bi weekly pandemic okay. malaise okay. update. Let's just keep it moving. It's still going on, though. Yeah. We okay. can just keep it moving. It is, but. I mean, you're. We're getting closer. Yeah. Yeah. To everyone getting vaccinated. We're celebrating your birthday soon. That's fun. I got both of my my shots. That's exciting. Got I'm both gonna, of my Fauci outies. Yeah, I'm supposed to be able to get mine by the end of this month. Yes, we just found out today. And you are going the minute that it opens. I sure am. I'm you will be banging the on the door. soonest available vaccine appointment. I'm going to be taking it. Thank you very much. Okay. So anything else? Any news updates? Just my Fauci outies. Brief that sharing of yeah. yeah. Okay. We're like in the process of planning prom and a senior trip and graduation and trying to come up with options and it okay it, okay it is like i think i told you this last week but i mean in here in ohio we're going through our weird fake spring briefly uh uh-huh. we're in that back and forth of like will it will it blizzard snow tonight and why is it, is gonna it be 70, 70 70 degrees tomorrow yeah. it will be 70 yeah. but last night there was yeah. snow so there's no in between yeah ohio goes back and forth between <clears throat> freezing and 70 degrees for about two months so starting now but there was a day last week like the first time it hits 50 it's like a whole new world out there like for teachers like they already know it we also can your just allergies tell. explode so that well, happened that but also the kids lose their minds uh-huh they dance on cars and such <laughs> yeah so there was a day last week where the kids like want to go outside and uh-huh. whatever and it truly Truly felt like a normal school year all of a sudden. That's nice. That's a nice feeling. It was the first time this year that I was like, ugh, they're doing the normal spring thing of like losing their minds. And I told all of my students today, I was like, you're going to come in tomorrow and you're going to get dress coded because you're going to forget what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. We have rules. Well, no, but I just mean like the first time that it gets warm enough for everyone to wear shorts, it's just Mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Mm Um, I'm not defending the dress code, but I'm just saying it's an <laughs> active part Consult of my life. Consult episode two for more right. information on that. was two, wasn't it? I think it really was. <laughs> but anyways, it's just, I'm always like, you know, it's going to happen uh-huh. when it gets warm. Uh-huh. Everyone's going to come out in the new shorts they got. And not all of the shorts are as cool appropriate. <laughs> and you're going to come in here and you're going to be salty. Keep those butt cheeks hidden away. Truly, please. <laughs> I need it. You need it. <laughs> Okay, well, cool. Um, Anyways, so that's a good feeling, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, spring makes me... I always love this time of year. Interesting. I love it. That's weird, because for me, the after Christmas, before the end of school year, that, that time period, was always, it always felt like a big slog to well, me, because there weren't any breaks. January and February give me hope because of snow. Okay, okay. Snow days. I can get through, because there's always hope of snow. Uh-huh. So, like, as a teacher, I can live. March, I'm like, eh, but it used to be like softball season, which I always got excited for. And I just enjoy being outside in the weather. So mm-hmm. like it getting the slightest bit warm and having a little bit of daylight and I no longer have to depend on my fake happy light to survive. It's like a good feeling. Good. There's a little bit of sun when I drive to school at 6am. Yeah, I could probably do with some sun. We're going to start walking again. But I, I just love this time of year and I shouldn't because it's testing. But I really like what I teach in the spring. So I, you know. Well, that's good. I'm glad you can. Uh, it's giving me. Yeah, I'm know, glad you can find a hope in this. Chugga in this chugga choo chooing through it. Chugga chugga choo choo. Well, you picked this week's topic. Oh, yeah, I did. I have had this on the list for quite a while, and I wasn't really sure how we were going to structure it. And I'm still not sure that it really has any structure. But we wanted to talk about education, <laughs> teaching, learning in the context of fiction. This so, was definitely an episode where I had to let you get started on the notes. Usually I'm like the notes and, you know, and you kind of work around what I've already thrown in. Yeah. And this time I was like, what am I? Well, I think I actually texted more... you to be like, what are you looking for? <laughs> yeah. The, the, this one is a little bit more nebulous for sure. But so we're going to talk about, you know, depicting education in fiction or using education or teaching or learning or schools as sort of tools for crafting fictional narratives or, you know, just convey, conveying meaning in this context. So we're just looking at school, learning, teaching, being a student in fiction. 
and I think they're, I, I don't know, this is not an exhaustive list, but I kind of group these things. We're going to just sort of talk about a few of our favorite examples and what they do for us as readers, what they do for schools or what they do for educators. And I kind of, in a big way, grouped these things together into a couple of different categories. The first one is myths and stories that help us explore how learning works. The second one is narratives that either critique or praise educational institutions, either obliquely or directly. And then third is narratives that unfold against the backdrop of education or schools or teaching and learning. So where, where those like schools or something kind of become almost a character in, in the narrative. So those are the three very vague groupings. And we're just going to talk about some examples in each one of those and how they help us craft meaning about learning for ourselves. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. No, I like this topic. I wasn't sure what it was. Oh, I'm still not sure what it is. But, but I'm I'm happy with the conversation. I think so. it'll make more sense after we talk about it. So let's just dive right in. <laughs> let's just see where we go. Yeah, let's just okay. see where it goes. I, I mean, it's in not... seven-part special <laughs> of 16 to 1. <laughs> it's, um, it's not very structured, but I'm hoping at the end that we'll have some interesting things to think about. So anyway, the, the first category there. So myths, stories, l- legends, novels, whatever you want to call it. Fiction that helps us explore how learning works. So the very first one I picked, and you were poking a little bit of fun at me for for this one because it's nerdy, but... Um, Okay, yeah. So the very first one is what is commonly called the cave allegory from Plato's Republic. This is kind of a big and obvious one for for people who are interested in Western philosophy vaguely. You're shaking your head at me because it's not big and obvious to you. I get it. I get it. I had to Google it. I'm no, actually going to Google it right this moment. Well, okay, listen. Is this like... Tell me the cave allegory. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing because it's kind of fun to read for yourself. But the, the, the general idea, Socrates and Glaucon are having a conversation about many things, but among them is how learning works. And they talk about some weird geometry stuff for a while with a line that's divided. And then eventually they get to this thing that is this story that is Socrates goofing about and having Glaucon walk through this strange mind palace of what if learning worked this way. So he tells a story about a bunch of prisoners who are chained so their heads can't move. They're chained to like look forward at a wall. And on the wall, there are projections of images that are actually coming from behind the prisoners but they can't see that so there are these shadows that kind of are like outlines of things like trees and people and chairs and whatever they're outlines of things that are being cast shadows that are cast on the wall and that's all they've ever known and so they think that that's what the world is the shadows of the things yeah they think that the shadows of things are what is real and what is true so at some point somehow one of these prisoners gets free one imagines that they would have to be freed but we kind of talk about that later so anyway one of them gets free and they crawl out of the cave and then their eyes are like omg it is so bright i cannot see anything everything is blurry because i have gone from the world of shadows into the world of the actual light of the sun hitting things and my eyes hurt so they're upset about that for a while but then they're like oh my eyes are adjusting and now i can look at things and then eventually i don't (laughs) i don't recommend this part of the story in in terms of actually doing but they start to look directly at the sun Hmm. Uh, like our previous president (laughs) yeah he has some experience with this part of the cave analogy that's for sure yeah so they look supposedly eventually maybe are able to look directly at the sun because their eyes have adjusted and then uh, so they've seen you know what the real world is and how it works and it's not shadows and then at the end of this whole thing, Socrates is like, okay, now what if one of them decides to go back into the cave, presumably, possibly to help other people become free and go out and look at the real sun and frolic in the real fields? And then uh, Socrates is like, well, wouldn't the people who are in the cave think that that guy is a Looney Tune for what he's saying about how the real world works because they've only ever known this sh- shadow world? Mm-hmm. And uh, Glaucon's like, yes, mm-hmm, yeah, they would probably think he was kind of crazy. And Socrates is like, and wouldn't they, like, wouldn't they probably kill him? Glaucon says, yeah, yeah, probably they would, they would kill him. So then, uh, there you go. That's the end of the cave story. <laughs> That's it. I mean, kind of. Okay. So, so what is uh, what is going on here? Is I feel like you left out some stuff. No, no, that's really that's really it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there about philosophy, and this is the truth. But anyway, as you can okay. imagine. Sure. The process of helping people understand that they are in a shadow world 
and learning is going beyond the shadow world and into the world of light and the real and the good and true and whatnot. That is sort of how education is described in this hmm. allegory. Okay. Okay or story or whatever you want to call it sure i think we could i have a note here we could probably do like an entire podcast about this i mean the yeah. republic but also just to be ridiculous and sum it up the, the passage kind of tries to talk about how learning works and also in a sense positions learning as a political activity which is going to be a theme for what i'm talking about here because it's an activity that involves power dynamics between people living together in some form of society because there's somebody who is presumably who, who has ventured forth from the cave and seen something and there's somebody else who has only ever been in the cave so there's obviously like a power dynamic there's a power difference between those two individuals so mm. that happens and then also the whole hey we'll kill you if we don't like what you're saying thing which in fact did happen to socrates he was tried and found guilty of corrupting the youth of athens and was sentenced to death by drinking hemlock so this was a bit of a drinking what hemlock poison yeah i don't recommend it um, oh my gosh yeah, no. So so basically this is a sort of We're prefiguring really doing of, it all in this episode. <laughs> it's a kind of prefiguring of what happened to Socrates, but the 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 implication there is that being an educator is really hard and sometimes really dangerous, which yeah. it is. I bet you can relate to this. Um okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm just reading about the trial of Socrates briefly. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was um, a big it's a big deal. They look like they're sad to be making him drink the poison. Well, he was very well liked among his cir circle of philosophical buddies and wrestling friends. Okay. So they're like, no, don't. And everyone else is like, you have to. Anyway, so. Yeah, sorry. I'm yeah, just, no, no. There's a lot is, of information to, for you to absorb lot. all at once, I'm sure. It is. Um, so with each of these texts, we're just going to ask ourselves, what does a text either like this or what does this text specifically do for the reader, for educators, and for schools? For the reader, this perhaps kind of obviously gets at the heart of like what we're doing when we're learning. How how is you know how is learning right. accomplished? Is it difficult? Is it worthwhile? How do we get other people to learn? For educators, it's kind of the same story, but it should also, like I mentioned, kind of highlight some of the challenges of being an educator because it's not nice or easy to tell people that what they've been seeing their entire lives is just shadows on a wall. That doesn't often go well for people who have a vested interest in thinking that their reality is the reality, which is, you know. The only reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then for schools, I've discussed, I've read this text or discussed it in basically every single formal education experience i've had so we did it in high school in my philosophy class we did it in college it was like a big part of my college experience and then i also read it in grad school when i was actually in the college of education so this is kind of a big one i, I think that what i found is that the the more institutional the the educational entity the less the less critically that text was read <laughs> <laughs> like the bigger the school the more bureaucracy it was the more it felt like we were doing spark notes versions of talking about the republic and the cave instead of really talking about them so it's kind of a hmm. it's like a warning and also something that is has been easily kind of tropified and transformed over time into this more neutral blase thing or whatever but it really is an interesting work and it can do a lot okay yeah i'm, I'm interested we're gonna have to read the republic now i think i'll add it to my list yeah put it at the top of your list it's a good one my list is long yeah my list is long okay so next my, yes my next one I've talked about it before on the podcast is Emile by Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So this was a, <laughs> this was a fun one because it was banned in Paris and Geneva and it was like publicly burned in the year that it was published. And I think we had a we trivia, love that. We, I think we had a trivia question about this maybe. I think you did. It, it got a little dicey for, for the religious entities at the time because it encouraged people to approach religious teaching, not as dogma to be accepted, but as, you know, thoughts to be interrogated and questioned with some healthy skepticism and such that was not popular with the church at the time uh, as you can imagine mm -hmm. so anyway emil this is like sort of a treatise and sort of a novel my dad's in the middle of reading it right now and he <laughs> texts me and he's like this is so boring in some parts i'm like yeah it's because it's kind of like it's kind of like dry philosophy mashed into the background of novel like thing. So he's like, mm -hmm. it's fiction, but it's also like, oh, and by the way, here's my philosophical tre sure. treatise on the nature of education. So this book is about, Rousseau is all about this natural man thing. And I won't go too much into that, but suffice it to say, he thinks it's an important 
concept, natural man versus like civilized or societal man or something like that. And there's a tension between those two things. And Emil is kind of about the journey from natural man, which we all are supposedly when we're born, to the man of society. And he's got this really highly prescriptive model of education that he goes through throughout the course of the book. For every stage long development, there's a different method of educating kids, or at least this kid, Emil, that the tutor in the book is educating. So it starts off by allowing uh, Emil to roam around and explore the world and be interested in things there's a lot of self-directed study mm. that's encouraged at this age oh. so it was like we shouldn't force them to study all these things we should let them decide what they want to learn about because their curiosity is important in terms of what they learn and their motivation for learning and all that stuff which is reminds me of some montessori type stuff i was just about to say yeah, yeah it's kind of like that but obviously filtered through weird rousseau speak so you know eventually we move on to kind of like a tutoring approach, like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring thing. And then eventually Emil is allowed to go into society. Supposedly he won't be corrupted by it if everything turns out well, but he like immediately meets a lady gasp oh, and it's no. not really clear that he's prepared to oh, handle this. Oh no. Yeah. Those ladies. Oh no. They always come along and mess everything up. So um, bad. Gasp. A woman. So it's not really clear that he's super prepared to handle that kind of social relationship but the last part of the book is about the education of women so if you ever read it i'm sure that you would find that part very interesting and possibly infuriating but okay. uh yeah Probably but we got so. that yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so kind of like the cave story emil is this weird grand thought experiment for how learning works or should work whether or not the kind of education in emil is possible or even Desirable in some cases is up for debate. Rousseau himself gave, I think, four or five kids of his own up to orphanages because he's like, I don't want to deal with them. And then he's the guy who supposedly wrote this book on education. So, you know, that colors the whole thing that changes ever so slightly bit. the book reads like ah had i not been a terrible horrible father of human beings this might be what i would have done but i didn't do that so here we are it is really interesting though like i said it's like educational and political theory kind of all mashed up into a novel so for the reader we get lots of questions about proper methods of education and goals of education so hmm. yeah the idea of like guiding children toward eventually being healthy functioning adults within society checks out y yeah but going from natural man to society man is not always what i would think modern educators describe their like <laughs> that's probably not how you would describe your day-to-day -day. No. oh i'm going to prepare these you know no. <laughs> little beasts to be ah yes the problem societal man. features mm. uh societal figures so you know anyway that's kind of a yeah I, so is this guy just all talk basically well we kind of yeah okay. i was just about to say like for educators i would not recommend this as like a play-by-play -play for how to do sure. education at all first of all because of rousseau's own personal problems with being any kind of adult or parent figure to mm -hmm. his own children so there's this weird hypocrisy going on but second of all because it's really weird some of the things he suggests like he's got thoughts on what their diets should be he's got he's got thoughts on like how you're supposed to swaddle or not swaddle kids he's got opinions about a lot of things okay. um yeah but it can definitely inform pedagogical practice and beliefs and and such and it can be very interesting that way um schools I would say the book is kind of anti-institutional in that the relationship between teacher and student is very much like this weird one-on-one -on -one tutoring thing in the context of, I mean, it, maybe it's not weird over time, but it, it feels weird to us in terms of how we yeah. have chosen to carry out schooling yeah. for the most part. Like 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 public education doesn't look sure. anything like this at all. But it positions education as a sort of special relationship between student and tutor, one that only works with a lot of love and care. And there's also a lot of agency that is reserved to the student hmm. in, in this case so the self-direction thing is foundational aspect of it makes sense yeah it's very interesting it's a very big book it's a very long book there's a lot in there that would just sound like crazy town to a modern reader crazy town yeah but not because it's just because it's unfamiliar but gotcha. there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there highly recommend huh. so anyway interesting okay so now moving on to a different category of these works of fiction narratives that either critique or praise educational institutions either in a roundabout way or directly you had a note in here that you tend hmm. to not like I... depictions of education in fiction <laughs> and why is that i think sometimes it's 
critical and harsh. And it's not because I'm, this is a tough one. I understand the importance of teachers, so I know what a bad teacher can do. So I am aware that for some people, all it took was that one bad one, and then they're all bad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so I think that that's sometimes what we see come through. And I, I don't know, I haven't seen that much of it, fiction in this case, done accurately in terms of the teacher side or like the school side of it you know what i mean mm. like you it's always, always the read, antagonistic yeah like you always angle. read the perspective of the student who's in trouble or the student who whatever and it's i'm sure it's just because that's a more interesting and more universal conversation uh-huh but i feel like a lot of times i'm thinking of teachers and glee and stuff like that like the way that teachers can be stereotyped and typecasted is just not helpful <laughs> for yeah. most of us <laughs> yeah and so and it's like oh the coach who doesn't do anything it's all of these things that can be true of some teachers yeah but uh -huh. that gets put on all of us sure and so i really can't think of any sort of fiction where i felt like oh that's real like that that's what it feels like you know you you often yeah i think this is interesting because your perspective is obviously that of a teacher so you don't feel like you find yourself portrayed well in fiction when it no, comes to educators no, being no. a part of the story no yeah i would say that's fair even this first fictional world that i chose is of this genre that you talked about that's critical of the teacher and the educational institution but i wanted to include it because the whole thing almost serves as a sort of warning about certain kinds of learning or maybe teaching or something so i i put in here the chronicles of narnia because i grew up reading these books mm -hmm. um i still reread them every once in a while because i think they're just really fun to get lost in but i thought this one was pretty notable because there's a distinct lack of educational institutions even though they're all kids in the storyline there's like really not a lot of school going on i think the only depictions of school that i actually can remember are maybe in they're like Jill and Eustace are characters in one of the books and they I think there's some bullying that happens at schools but it's weird to me that that these books seem to be anti-educational institutions because uh, C.S. Lewis was so entrenched in what was the sort of academia of the, of the time you know really? he was like very yeah he was just very in the world of formal Oxbridge-y kind of you know Englandy Tudor blah 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 kind of stuff hmm. I mean maybe he was bullied or something i don't even know what but like he's somewhat hostile to educational institutions in the books and part of the reason for that is that the books in general the sort of overarching theme of them is that narnia is this magical place where kids get sucked into to have fun adventures and learn about themselves and grow and learn important lessons obviously with religious undertones in this case but for him you can get to a point where you can age out of being available to those adventures. You can mm -hmm. get to a point where you've become too accustomed to the real world and suddenly you lose your sense of wonder and you're not open to, yeah, you, you know, true. you're not open to the magic of Narnia at a certain point. So it's like, well, you know, you get to be in your late teenage years and suddenly you have some skepticism and pragmatism that you've acquired in the real world and you your ability to learn and to encounter wonderful new things without that kind of baggage is is depleted over time huh. so i think even though there's this antagonism toward education it's like the polar express yeah it is actually <laughs> uh, that's the other one that i thought of i thought of exactly that it was just like when you can't hear the bell anymore mm -hmm. or whatever it is right <laughs> as a kid i got totally lost in these books and i consume them differently now it's almost like i'm the one that he, you know whatever we're the ones that we were warned not to be eventually where it's just like i mean but i still feel like i can get into these books and get get lost in them so it's kind of nice it's an exercise I read them well it's a kind of exercise oh. for me in setting aside adult concerns yeah. and worldly concerns and just my third grade teacher it. read yeah i know you had a scarring experience with these it books. felt like all of them it's, maybe it was all of them i think that was really unfair and we should we should go back and try again okay i'll you, just add that to my list now too right after i think the lesson of them like both for educators in schools is don't let kids grow up too quickly make room for adventure i mean and she wonder. was totally going about the christian version christian dogma yeah approach. like that's 100 percent what she was doing yeah and in third grade i hadn't you know was unable to make those sorts of yeah whatever yeah anyways that's i will be willing to maybe do it again i don't know yeah well uh, you might be able to find them delightful insofar as they treat life as a sort of 
adventure that you can fall find yourself falling into and that it, it kind of just reminds you to be open to the wonder of those sorts of experiences mm-hmm. in general and then we finally i'm sorry that was like a lot of talking i just no, had all my examples okay. up front Yours but like just up front. you've got a you've got one the next one and we've been rereading these ones actually so yeah so the next one is harry potter uh-huh. and i i could I think that the stories of Narnia and Harry Potter are very similar from what I remember of Narnia. But I think mostly what I mean is just that for you, it was an escape just like Harry Potter is an escape. And so I think that they're serving children in the same way. So you and I mean, not that I'm saying that J.K. Rowling can hold a candle to the wind compared to C.S. Lewis, but I think they're attempting to do the same thing. But who didn't want to go to Hogwarts? Like, I would still go. Yeah, I wanted to go to Narnia desperately as a child, so. I would still go to Hogwarts. Yeah, when we were kids. It wouldn't even. We were, like, at exactly the right age for these when they first came out. We grew up with them, truly. I think we kind of, like, lost our minds during the pandemic and started, decided to, like, reread them with our friend group. And we've been much more, like, we've seen how the fiction lacks in a lot of ways now that I did not notice when I was a kid. So it makes it a little weirder because you can't quite enjoy it it in the same way but for me like a harry potter is just the characters that's where i keep that's where i can keep you know my brain is that the people of it are what i care about more than the partially bad writing and things like that yeah i would still go to hogwarts if i got my letter today Mm -hmm. even knowing what i know about it i would Mm. still subject myself so you would you would be going to hogwarts in a post battle of hogwarts world i would do it yeah, I'm if sure there's any chance changed. that McGonagall is still there, she's I'm the there. headmistress, probably. Oh, so. well, I'm there <laughs> as an adult. As we've been rereading this, I'm like, mm, that place must have really great insurance <laughs> because <laughs> all they would have is legal troubles. <laughs> they do have a lot of problems. It's like, oh, sorry, <laughs> our students kept getting turned to stone by a giant basilisk. Oh, sorry about the troll that just keeps. Sorry about up. the troll from the dungeon. Sorry. Anyways, so I look at it and I'm like, this is a nightmare. Don't worry. We made the Triwizard <laughs> Tournament much safer. <laughs> Only one person will die. Um, Only one instead of more than one. Okay. So, but like part of my notes were that <laughs> it's, so, it's just really hard to work through it. But so like I said, as an adult, I'm like, this place is expensive. They always have lawsuits on their hands. They're probably not servicing students as required by their needs based on how some of these teachers teach. But that's not what they're really there for, I don't think. Um, they ignore the yeah. the, the five hundred fours and the IEPs. There's no IEPs. Yeah. No IEPs in Hogwarts. So, but like, it's funny because we've talked about the education system in Hogwarts to be like, why, why would you just let this person teach? Why does Gilderoy get to come in and like? Oh, Gilderoy makes me mad. But like, it cracks me up because I'm like. Eh, it could happen. Like literally, it the world of education is such that it's possible. Um, so realistically, Hogwarts is probably a little bit more like our education system than we want to admit. Yeah, no, I think less that trolls, that's really less true. dragons. There's whatever. a lot of politics too, and there's a lot of, like they nail that. The they nail that pressure from the like. Okay, so JK, in like the struggles between teachers, totally yes, right. Dra- teacher drama, even student drama. J.K. Rowling is proving herself to be problematic in all kinds of different ways now. But if you just set that aside for just a second, one thing that I do think she does well is depict bureaucracy Mm -hmm. her depictions of the ministry of magic how the ministry of magic involves itself in the day-to-day affairs of hogwarts even though it's just like why don't you just let teachers teach it's like i mean you have a note in here about how it's like the ohio department of education like it's about it's it very much feels like they're under the influence of a state department of education and their hands are tied and they can't do this and they can't do that and they can't mcgonagall says that kind of stuff yeah i mean yeah. yeah haggard when he starts teaching that was me my first year of teaching. <laughs> That's how it felt. If you like, want to know what it's like to be a first year teacher, unleash just a hippogriff. Hagrid and just <laughs> and some blast ended scroots. <laughs> yeah, the scroots. No, but I mean that I really like because it's very it's not only because I love Hagrid, but it's very endearing. But as a first year teacher, oh my gosh, so hard. So this is one of those those rare times you would say that the sort of struggles of teachers are accurately there, depicted. There maybe. are moments of it that hundred yeah. percent yeah. she has she has gotten it. Uh-huh. Um and either she knows it or someone who helped her knows it. Or maybe she had a teacher like that, which is possible. Yeah, there there are moments where I'm like, this is this is what it's like, which is fun. So what does Harry Potter do for the reader? I'd said it's just like, I mean, it's just like Narnia. It's an escape. And I also put, and this is about like for educators too, but anything that gets someone to read is something that I want them to read. Like, yeah, absolutely. that's where I get, that's literally where it boils down to for me. If I have a kid who gets into it and reads them, 
have at it. And that's the most important thing. I will get, I mean, I will put a book in your hand for any reason, but if you will keep reading it, then that's great. Mm-hmm. For schools, and I've, like, I'm sure you remember this, but remember growing up how it was, like, not Christian and scary and, like, witches and wizards and how everyone wanted to ban Harry Potter? Yeah, we had some religion, religious people in our school who were like, we can't be that because it's got witchcraft right. in it. And so, I'm I like, would... oh, which is weird to me because I wonder whether those same parents would let their kids read Narnia because there's dark, deep Probably magic not. and old magic in Narnia, too, but it's yeah. supposedly a Christian allegory. Yeah. So it's like, hmm well it's different um you know that come on now. it's different don't play games um, it's different and i have i've never taught harry potter but i've taught one chapter of harry potter and it's the only it's the chapter about the prophecy that could either be neville or harry mm-hmm. and i taught it and it went pretty well but i was teaching at a conservative school and i got scared so i haven't done it <laughs> I got scared. but like again for schools for educators i just want kids reading i don't care what it takes mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and i still have kids even now who get in the harry potter and when was the last book released when we were in forever ago college high school yeah something like that i think i think high school was the last book high school or uh, maybe early college i was reading the last one i can't remember but still i I mean we're talking 12 years ish yeah and still today my kids come carrying harry potter through the door Hmm. so i am not disappointed in that at all yeah so the next section you have is narratives that basically use education as part of it it's not like the central focus Mm -hmm. right is that your yeah stuff that like happens in school i mean and harry potter kind of falls into this a little bit because like hogwarts is kind of like a i I mean later on i i wanted to talk about looking for alaska because i feel the same way about looking for alaska it's almost as if the school is kind of a character yeah. in the and hogwarts is that way i want to just talk about stories where it's like we're not talking about formal education as right. such but it's such a big it kind of looms so large in these particular works mm-hmm. of fictions that you can't help but analyze what role the school or the teacher or the student plays in these stories so you pick this first one and i haven't read or seen seen this so i have no idea 13 about, Reasons Why. Yeah, 13 Reasons Why. Ugh. It's a book by Jay Asher that is most famous now because uh, Netflix has turned it into, I think, like four seasons. Hmm. I read the book probably my first year of teaching, so eight years ago, mm-hmm. and a co-worker taught it, and that's how I got the book to read it. So it was something that was taught in our school. And then probably, I don't know, five years ago is when they first released the first season, and the first thing I want to say about this is that, and I dealt with this when she was teaching it, and I remember when Netflix came out with it, people were always bashing 13 Reasons Why for being a show that glorified suicide. Mm-hmm. And I a book hearing about that, that glorified suicide. And what that tells me is, one, they didn't watch it or did they read it. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the show and the book are different, for sure, but the first season at least does have the heart of the book with it, which is, I enjoy. I'm going to just go through this quickly, but essentially a young woman in the book, this student, she is planning to complete suicide. And what she does is she creates 13, I think they're actually, I think they're actually cassette tapes that go to the people that have somehow either not necessarily caused it for all of them, but been a part of it. And I don't mean that in like a blame way, but I mean that like suicide is something that's very, very complicated and it's not just one thing, it's a ton of little things. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Jay Asher nails with this is that there are students who have these feelings and that they've probably not gotten to read a story like this. Mm -hmm. So as an educator, I love it because it's telling a hard story. As a school, I I know that it can be hard because you have to walk that line very carefully. But I feel like maybe today or maybe in five years, teaching something like this would be even more common because of the push for mental health support. But the school in that book and in that show is crucial to it because it centers around this high school and, and their these students and the, the few teachers that are involved and kind of their workings in it and then going through the grief of a suicide in a school. And so, I, I mean, it's hard to talk. Like, you don't want to be like, oh, it's great because it's, it's a really hard topic, but I think it does nail some of those really complicated relationships that happen in schools mm-hmm. and the sort of things that teachers are forced to do and have to do as part of it. And it's it's truly a story of survivor's guilt. It is not glorifying suicide. Sure. Um, I was going to say, this this actually happened. Uh, there was like a suicide when I was in high school at, at mm-hmm. my high school. And I will say that at the time, I'm interested. I really kind of am interested in reading this book or watching this show now because at the time the school just kind of pretended like it didn't happen, which I felt like 
was absolutely not the right thing. Well, no. So, like, the school as a character in this book, I hope maybe would be a little more active in. I mean, helping people navigate the issue. You know, but I would, I would bet that your school at the time that they were. Yeah, I like, mean, I, yeah. I think that it's hard to be critical of those things because all we've done since then is learn. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't think that schools have always been trauma informed. Yeah, I think that's more what I say. It's not. It's not that they didn't try to help. They absolutely did, and they were like, I, I think that certain kids who were close to this student got pulled into counseling, like stuff like that. But I feel like kind of modern educational institutions are much more willing now to talk about mental health issues than they were even yeah, the, recently, that's what I'm trying like to say. ten yeah. years ago mm -hmm. or twelve years ago, or you know, fifteen years ago. In my case, I, I think that at that time, people did not know how to confront it constructively. So we just didn't <laughs> so i i would hope and i would think like, like shows like this even play a part in kind of evolving the way institutions deal with this kind of stuff I, I would hope that now people can actually be like ah yes okay so this is what depression looks like this is what trauma yeah. looks like and that we can become more informed as educators as learners and all the kind of stuff about how to to confront issues like this mm -hmm. so yeah. i agree with that I, I don't want to really like give more of it away just because i know you haven't read it or watched it even i think it does a nice job of showing loss and things like that in a school and in my career and even in growing up like there was a classmate of mine who killed themselves i had a friend who died in the farming accident and then since i've been teaching i've lost a coworker and a couple of we've lost a couple of students it's it's not an easy grief at any age uh but in schools it's especially complicated so it's hard it's very hard and so i think that's why i like 13 reasons why and that's why i like looking for alaska as well is because mm -hmm. i think it does a good job of i don't know putting a focus on that and yeah. both of them are stories of survivor's guilt and yeah. so i think well that's let's move on to looking for alaska because i want to this one is i, I refuse to be critical i will only sing its glory and praises forever <laughs> you really like this book oh i love it I love to hate it's also, it. It's also been turned into a show. I hate it. Oh, okay. I love it. There's oh. no in between. You want some the more The first time it. I read this book, when that thing happened, I put it down and I stopped reading it. Uh -huh. I couldn't. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was... There's a big, rather tragic event in the book, but we were not going to say what it was. No. But it it surprised me in such a way that I couldn't actually finish reading it. How long did it take you to pick it back up again? Probably like a year. Wow, I was had that much of it. I mean, I, I was like, I remember I was laying in my parents' pool week one of summer. One of my students had recommended it. That's a rough one to be reading in the pool. Tell me about summer. it. Yeah. So I get to that and I was like, no, this is not my summer, and I quit. <laughs> and I think it was like the next year, literally. That well, I finally okay. Finished so it. set it up a little bit without Anyways, spoiling. Okay, here's here's what's most important. It is. <laughs> It's about a private boarding school that's set in Alabama. John Green wrote it, who is also uh, the author of Turtles All the Way Down and The Fall in Our Stars, um, Abundance of Catherines, all of those. And I could not love John Green's writing more if I tried. I think he is smart and witty, and I just love his brand. It is very delightful. To it's the kind of thing that makes you chuckle out loud like a whole bunch of times. It does. Even though it's, not, it's not a comedy he, kind of writing. It's, he just is yeah. so good at relationships. Uh -huh. And I think yeah. that's the best part. And like that is what I would say about all John Green books is that the relationships and the friendships that are in them feel like your people and like you could, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So anyways, most importantly about the book is that it's set at Culver Creek, which is a school. And they have what I could imagine to be probably the worst thing you could eat for yourself, but also the best thing you could eat for yourself. A buffrito. And it is a buffrito. A okay. buffrito. Anyways. A refried um, burrito. <laughs> so upsetting <laughs> it sounds so bad but long story short it's a story about a small group of mostly males and then their one friend alaska and this coming of age and love and loss and you know all of that yeah. but set within this private school yeah where they have been forced to live with people that they're not like and so it's it's like, a weird mix there's like just like most schools there's this kind of like class yes differences with like sure. class warfare between the weekend warriors they're called there's just like kids with lots of 
private yeah. school family money and then there are yeah. kids who are there who are like on basically on scholarship yeah, yeah. so i i i love culvert creek in this book first of all because i've told you i told you just when we were reading it but it reminds me of my college like yeah. just the eccentricities of a small private school are extremely well captured by this book mm -hmm. and the relationships that you can and part of the reason i like this book though is because it does it's not just like students against teachers there are a lot of like pranks there's that kind of adversarial yeah. relationship so like between the kids and their tas or like their ras or whatever they are you know the kind of yeah. whoever's in charge of supervising kids sometimes there's He's this likely, adversarial yeah. relationship but one that is in the end i think fundamentally tries to be healthy yeah and the same thing between students and teachers and administrators at school like yeah there are rules they can't be broken the People show find a way really around nails them. that relationship yeah. i yeah. think better than the book even does so it's a like six part special on hulu i think it was six or eight yeah, episodes remember. just one of my favorite books it's a book that i have shared with some of my former students and we we will share that love forever and so it's always going to be uh, a favorite of mine but again it it nails the relationships that happen and i just think it it feels so real like for both of us having gone to pretty small schools and like mm -hmm. i mean your college was much smaller but i mean we we can identify with these types of you know things yeah. Yeah. and the school is as important to the story as they are and so a lot of it yeah. is just I think teenagers that's the thing being that's fun about it. Right? Teenagers, uh, it's definitely a lot about the work they're not doing and should be doing. There is the big essay that winds itself through uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, that does a really nice job of wrapping up some. They have to be stuff. writing. They're writing this essay basically throughout the course of the book, and it's not it's not super well defined. I mean, they can write about almost whatever they want. Yeah, uh, big questions that they have, but yeah. Yeah, I I just think that this kind of depiction of a school in fiction is very useful for people because it shows how a school can really can and is often a very tight-knit community yeah. first and foremost well and like the scene in there where they're dealing with the loss and the grief i have seen that mm -hmm. and it's so much like what we've had to do mm -hmm. and so i i think that's what makes it so much more real is that you've been there it does feel very real it feels very real yeah and yeah. and the show is just i mean I would never compliment a show for being anything like a book, but it is just brilliant. I mean, it's so well done mm -hmm. compared to the book. Mm -hmm. And we were able to pick out lines that we knew were in the yeah. book that yeah. they had used. I would so, say it's very true to the book. In oh, terms 100%. Of, there are not many TV shows that are very true no. to books, but... So yeah. another one that does that, like I said, looking for Alaska by John Green. Do not Google it. Do not go searching. Yeah, don't look it up ahead of time. Order just, it. Just read it. Let it sit on your counter read it get mad put it down come back in a year and then finish it and then only compliment it forever okay it really is one of my favorites i can see that i get i get back into a place where i'm like oh i gotta read alaska again so i mean i kind of yeah. want to read it again now yeah you were like I, i'm not sure that post pandemic <laughs> like well still we in had pandemic, just finished it we're not even post pandemic yet but we're almost maybe maybe hopefully almost within the next year post pandemic and Maybe at that time we'll have the mental energy to work up to reading it again. Because yeah. it is a diff it's difficult. It's yeah. a difficult work of contemporary oh, fiction. Yeah. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's hard to get through. I mean, it's written for a young adult audience, but oh, it's it. it's one of these books where like almost all of these that we talk about in this episode are written for, they're like targeting a young adult audience, except for, mm -hmm. you know, Emile and the Republic. Although you could make the argument that maybe the Republic is targeting a young adult audience. I don't know. But almost all of these books, if not all of them, are are meant to last and to be useful mm -hmm. well throughout life as a young adult like i mean for me reading these books i don't think i had read a john green book until i was like 23 or 24 mm -hmm. and i still loved it mm -hmm. and so do they my kids come in with john green books. oh i didn't read until like when i was um, that last year or two yeah. years ago or but i mean like it? paper towns like i've read all of them and as soon as i got into them i couldn't stop mm -hmm. and he is just so well suited for that kind of writing mm -hmm. and i'm just so thankful for it because i still have kids come in with turtles all the way down and i love that book too so good for john green he nailed it he, he really gets it Okay, my last one. Yeah. Honorable mention, uh -huh. probably truly the MVP of the list, <laughs> is Matilda. I know you love Matilda. I, my love of Matilda is so great. Uh -huh. And if my mom was here, she would be also just 100% in support of Matilda because I was obsessed with this movie. Okay. It is a book. I know that. I have not read it. Oh, wow. Don't We gotta go me. read the book. No, no, no. We, we just leave Danny DeVito as he is. Oh, so, okay. 
Matilda is, oh gosh, it was out when we were young, so mid-90s, 90, uh-huh. whatever, six maybe. And it's a story of a young girl who her love of reading is what saves her essentially because she has a pretty horrible home life and her only escape is reading. Mm-hmm. And so she's brilliant. And so, oh, it's just so cute. Anyways, um, <laughs> she has this incredible teacher named Miss Honey. And I think everyone needs a Miss Honey. I've definitely had a Miss Honey in my life. But Miss Honey is like this dream teacher. And then her aunt, you find out, is Trunchbull, who's like, I think she's like the principal, some administration, whatever. And she's horrible. And she puts kids in the chokey and all of this stuff. But even in like for Matilda, her safe place was school. Like his home was so horrible. Uh And so at school, Matilda has Miss Honey and her friend. And I'm trying not to give it away. It's such an old movie, but I don't want to ruin it all for you. But essentially what sets Matilda free is, is school and her reading and the fact that she can pick up a book and go anywhere. And so Miss Honey ends up adopting her. And so it's just this really great story of like a little girl who has a crappy home, who gets a better home. And we're, you know, just a dream story. Miss Honey as a teacher is like literally dream status and i think of her in the same way that i think of hillary swank's character in um freedom oh the writers. freedom writers yeah yeah that was a book too yeah it was a book and i'm just i've read the book as well but watching that movie seeing hillary swank in that role i probably should confirm that that was hillary swank it was okay thank god mm-hmm. um because then i was like wait that was million dollar baby but she's also that yeah but seeing miss honey as a teacher when I was that young made me want to have a Miss Honey and then I did have a teacher who was like Miss Honey Uh to me uh and then I got a little bit older and then I saw the Freedom Writers and that was a movie that really made me want to be an English teacher. Freedom Writers is like the the Dead Poet Society of our generation kind of. (laughs) But that movie had the shift in me finally to be like oh I could be that teacher. Uh-huh. And so then that's what Miss Henley like became. And the same Instead thing. Of and I even teacher, mentioned like, actually I could yes, do this. Yeah. Like I want to be that force. I want to be this person. Um, and I did the same thing briefly with Dead Poets, of course, has to be on the list um, just because Robin Williams is a genius. But I first watched it in high school and I was like, you know, in high school, I definitely had someone that was like um, that teacher. Now, at this age, I'm like, oh, I want to be that teacher, you know. OK. OK. Um, so anyways. Matilda, for me, what do they do for me as a reader? I'm talking about the movie, but it, it, not that I needed it reignited because I was so young, but I was also a girl who loved to read. So seeing Matilda was cool because yes. she was a young yes. girl who loved to read. And she had like cool powers. I mean, and it's stuff. just like the same thing we talked about, like Hermione and like, mm. it's like, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it's really funny now. Though, I mean, re- Hermione's insufferable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But- Rereading Harry Potter, I'm like, Hermione is so freaking annoying. But I mean, like, I was that. <laughs> That was me um, in middle school. For educators, I, I will give Miss Honey credit. She gives some teachers a good look. Uh-huh. So that's good. Except for maybe on the other end, she's a standard that none of us can ever be. So here we are again, back okay. at the circle. Okay. Um, for schools, though, I think, like I said, Trunchbull is horrible, but the school is like, you know, the safest place for Matilda. And I see that to be true every day. We have so many students that if they're in school, they're safer than what they were before and Mm -hmm. happier and things like that. So I think Matilda nails that stuff. And just great music. Oh, gotta love it. (laughs) So anyways, Miss Honey's the top of the list. Good. Well, how about you? Yeah. Top of the list. Uh, Robin Williams' character. Yes, yes, for sure. So why don't you wrap wrap it up and give us some some final thoughts on this whole topic of like education in fiction, what it does, what it accomplishes. I think it can do good, but I think what it also does, and this comes more quickly and easily than that, is that it can make people very quickly become, oh, I hate this teacher and they whatever. And so, again, I realize the importance of the role of a teacher in someone's life and how they really can make or break those things. Um, But it's hard because, like, teachers, like, I'm thinking of, like, Bad Teacher the movie and Glee, like I said, and... There's a new teacher show out that I refuse to watch because it's all about a teacher just having relationships with their students. Like, I don't need those stories. Anyone who knows teachers knows that that's, you know, an unfortunate side of what happens at times. But like many other careers, they make it look bad for all of us when the rest of us aren't, you know, doing Mm -hmm. those things. 
So, and I understand that that's, like, the sensationalism that, you know, makes those shows popular or whatever. And for some people, those are the true stories also. Like, to give those stories credit, like, that's a fact for some. Um, Which doesn't make me feel better about it. But, I... I mean, I'm sure you can't help but take it, take these kinds of stories personally because right. you are an educator. I do, and because that's probably why the I'm people who do that are okay with crappy them. educators. Yeah, like sure. the the teachers who prey on young people yes. because of whatever. Yes, like you suck anyways. So just go fly a kite. Like get out, you know. So that's what frustrates me about those is because then those are the like when that teacher show came out, there was all these conversations about how well this is just like a normal blah, and it's like okay, you knew one teacher who made you feel weird and now the rest of us and not that that was okay but the rest of us didn't well it's it's unfortunate because those kinds of shows cause an entire profession to come under scrutiny yes that's where i'm mad about right now which i understand anyways so i mean to be fair go to where lockhart does suck and coral does suck <laughs> but on the other end there coral was trelawney was kind of like possessed right although it was his fault sort of in but the like end. trelawney good stuff mostly she's weird but I mean, I don't know. As we've been rereading the books, she's actually not, maybe not I that like great her. of an educator either. I mean, she's she what she did do. Like, I have had teachers that remind me of Trelawney because she's strange. I get. I think what Trelawney shows me, she kind of reminds me of, of a tutor I had in college who was terrible for me, but who spoke to. I mean, not she was like wasn't trying to be terrible to me, but she was not a good ed- fit as an educator for me. But she was a great fit for a certain kind of student. She was a great fit for like students who had less confidence who were shy who didn't want to talk Mm -hmm. much and contribute much in class so like what it taught me was that even if some educators don't strike my fancy there's a sort of there's a teacher who can get through to everybody and that which means there's not some ideal perfect form of teacher that everybody must comply to in order to Mm -hmm. be you know a good educator it's like no actually different minds work in different ways and i mean i'm still like ticked off at her because of my own interactions with her but like I know for a fact that she absolutely positively contributed to other students' lives. Mm-hmm. So who am I to judge? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I my, my kind of wrap up thoughts. I, I guess because I'm not a teacher, I'm allowed allow myself to look at education in fiction a little bit more favorably because it's not about me so i mean it's not exactly fair but that's how it is so like i totally agree that teachers teachers have been kind of tropified into ridiculousness by yeah. certain contemporary fiction and media like and we really don't need more of that like yeah it's yeah, yeah. Hard enough to be this thing and absolutely absolutely we're always the bad guy and to be fair some of us really do suck like yeah i have had actual sucking to teachers. that sure. i know that um but dang it for those of us that are trying we're like <laughs> yeah absolutely so anyways well i was just saying that because i have the benefit of not worrying about this being about my real actual life i'm not going into a k-12 classroom every day like you are so because of that, my thoughts are not really yeah. in the trenches of teaching. Mm-hmm. So I'm allowed to encounter these kind of fictional depictions of education with a little more optimism because it's just not, it's not my day to day. So yeah. I think for me, encounters with teachers and students in schools and learning in fiction provides a useful framework and ideals against which to evaluate experiences. Yeah. So it's like, oh, we can strive toward this. Oh, we can look at learning. Like, look what learning can do. It also makes me aware of like, traps and pitfalls and dangers and stuff like that. But I think that in general, encounters with learning and fiction, they tend to reinforce fun or spark in the first place or reinforce beliefs about education. And that's it. like educators should be guiding, guiding students toward freedom and, and curiosity mm-hmm. and uh, self-efficacy and all of these kinds of things. Like the best depictions of education and fiction and even the ones that are critiquing education for the most part in the stuff that i've read it's it's with this goal of reinforcing how education can be liberating yeah so yeah i mean i've never seen a show that accurately shows what it's like to be a teacher so i would welcome that well i think that shows in general don't do an accurate job of depicting any profession well i mean like yeah you're probably right about that yeah that's fair they nail, I mean like I would shows, welcome it. I would welcome television a show shows about a group of teachers yeah. that actually shows the cuz I I think and also it tends to reduce things to tropes. That's it what does. They do. And I think that's also why I love looking for Alaska and 13 reasons why in the ways that I do is because like I've even recently had conversations with you and other people about you know today I had to deal with this episode or this particular thing or I have students going through 
different sorts of transition. Like teachers are kind of the homes of all of these things that other humans don't really have to facilitate in the way that we do so right, many times. Right. Some days it's just heavy, you know, like it's hard. And I don't think any shows have really done an accurate job of showing that. And like, you're right. Like probably no one is accurately portrayed in any of these types of things. But that's why I love looking for Alaska. And that's why I love 13 Reasons Why. Because that is the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's the stuff that makes up most of your days. Yeah. Like, it's not the fun jumping on a desk like, you know, dead poets. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we're not screaming into the void. I mean, it feels like it. I guess it is some days. But still. (laughs) And now that I'm saying that, I'm like, wait, every day is me screaming into the void. Anyways, I think... There are stories that can tell it accurately. And I think that these stories are important. Like I said, nothing that I'm critiquing about these tropes is to diminish the true stories of people who have been subjected to those things. But on the other end, it's like, come on. Well, some of us are better than yeah, that. Yeah, I get that. Know? But I guess I would argue that even inaccuracy is important sometimes too. Like, yeah. Because you can be because you can be like, look at what it could be. Yeah, and that's in, fair Inaccuracy too. in the kind of positive yeah. aspirational direction is not a bad thing. If we were not doing this episode mid to end of a pandemic where <laughs> teachers were only ever taken to slaughter, I'd probably feel differently. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. It is a heavy I would time. be willing to accept that maybe yeah. I'm coming into this a little bit heated <laughs> coming in hot okay but really yeah anyways are you ready to move on fill in the blank oh yeah i'm ready i could just sing john green's praises all day if you yeah, like yeah. but yeah really, let's let's wrap it up yeah, okay sounds good okay fill in the blank last week's question you want to mm-hmm. read it yeah so our last episode's question was this the release date of that episode was march 4th and that used to be the last day of a president's term until which amendment went into effect in january of 1933 the goal of that amendment was to eliminate part of the lame duck period and made noon on January 20th, the end of the term for presidents and vice presidents. That amendment was the 20th. Hmm. And like we said, we had to get George Washington's booty all the way to New York City. So, yeah, we did. We don't got to do that Take anymore. Some time. We can move it up two months. Yeah. A month and a half. Yeah. Okay. This episode's question. Yeah. Okay. So when this comes out yesterday it would have been st patrick's day so there's a color scheme to st patrick's day but it wasn't always the same color scheme but it's thought that the shift to green happened because of ireland's nickname being the emerald isle obviously there's green in the irish flag and the shamrocks and clovers and so green ribbons and shamrocks were worn as early as the 17th century apparently so wearing even though wearing green has become a staple of st patrick's day the holiday used to be originally associated with another color and what was that color did you know that I did not know it. I didn't either. All right. All right. What'd you learn? I'm going to compliment TikTok because I just learned this like two days ago. Oh. With you. Oh. Okay. And it was about how, wasn't it income tax? Ah. Tax brackets. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. I learned how tax brackets work, which tells me that our <laughs> education system has at least failed me in that way. Oh, oh no. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. No, I thought that you got taxed at the percent of whatever of your whole yeah, it's only the income above the yes. bracket threshold that so gets anyways, that. So anyways, I just assumed that that was the case. Uh-huh. That is not the case. Uh-huh. Um, and instead, you are taxed on each bracket, that percentage of whatever up to a maximum amount. Yes. And so you just keep moving up the brackets and being taxed at X amount until you reach the end of how much money you make. Uh-huh. So I thought you just made, or you just paid a, you know, percentage flat of tax. your whole... It's a flat tax versus brackets is is what you're what we're talking about here. Yeah. So, I learned that and that is important. Mm-hmm. And I probably should have learned that before 30, but here we are. So, <laughs> I, I mean, mean, honestly, taxes are one of those things I ship off and I'm like, god. So, taxes are luck. are uh, we this is perhaps familiar to a lot of people now, but taxes are intentionally kept cryptic and weird because tax preparation companies lobby the US government to keep tax filing complicated so they're like let's make this really complicated so that people can't understand it so they'll keep paying us for the services they they, they spend so gazillions of dollars lobbying the u.s government to keep it complicated it could be much easier like you could have known this before you were 30 well i could have but to be fair uh-huh. i probably wasn't listening because i was like you know what i'll have someone do that for me and guess what i have someone do that for me yeah that was interesting though that is interesting. Um, but it's also just been surrounding all the talk of the stimulus and things like that. So I really have been learning quite a bit. Uh-huh. Like, I learned that people that are experiencing homelessness can get st- their stimulus checks. Did you know that? I would have assumed so. But, 
Yeah. Yeah, they can, there's like a... Uh. It would be hard to track them down to send them checks, but... Well, no, they can have it put on a, a visa, like a debit card. Oh, like a debit, yeah. Um, Interesting. By, I think they have to... I, let me check on this, but I, uh-huh. I think they have to visit like a tax bureau, something like that, and they can get them that way, which well, I wasn't aware of. That's good to know, though. I'll try to include a link in the notes Yeah, for that. Good. But I learned that as well, which made me feel briefly better, but still not great. Also very good. All right. What did you learn? You didn't write anything down. So you didn't learn anything. All right. So this is a frustrating one, but I learned about NFTs like most of the rest of the Twitter world. We've all been talking about (laughs) NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which are basically just a really expensive hoax, a really pricey, environmentally disastrous way to spend. It's just like a new way to spend money. It's a new way. You know what we need? Another way to spend money. So, So NFTs are essentially, it's a cryptocurrency. It's like a blockchain based way of processing art so it what has resulted in is people spending like thousands and thousands millions sometimes of dollars on tweets or jpegs or like whatever like people buy digital art so that they it's basically you're only buying bragging bragging rights to the art you'll be like oh that tweet i own that tweet it's like Mm -hmm. you what do you mean you own that tweet it's on the internet nobody owns that tweet Mm -hmm. but it's just like people are like you know what i'm really bored and i just i need a new way to spend my my millions are they just using it for tax breaks i oh that's my theory but i don't know if it's actually true or not but because like you know sometimes you can write off you did teach me about bitcoin i should have mentioned oh bitcoin yeah i have uh, been mining talking about bitcoin mining but yeah no so nfts don't don't spend don't spend your money that way because basically you're contributing to to global warming when you do this because the amount of computing power required to process these transactions it's just damaging the earth and you're just you're spending money again like i said on a, on a tweet like you're, like what does it even mean to buy a tweet are we really in such a, a, a late capitalist dystopian hellscape that we've decided that we we can buy tweets i i don't even know but anyway that's it's been very much in the discourse these last couple of weeks because people started spending millions on on nfts and so uh so here we are that's where we are that's what i kind of learned about yeah. i didn't learn much about it because it annoyed me too much to learn more than a little bit about mm-hmm. it but that's what i that's yeah. what i learned about it's something that i'm sure it'll keep coming back up i think that like there are a lot of interesting possibilities with with cryptocurrencies and the blockchain and monetization because like right now monetization on the web means plastering your website with ads and i think that cryptocurrencies can provide a new avenue for creators to make money on the web that doesn't involve plastering your sites Mm -hmm. with ads so like that possibility is very interesting to me but but this nft stuff is just it's it's absurd so yeah well always learning yeah don't burn down a rainforest don't buy nfts it's time for pasta. I must go. Okay, we must go. Eat pasta. We'll see you next time on 1. Bye. Bye. Hey, listeners. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Mm.